Imitate God. Tonight's subject is Imitate God. Every one of us, if we will look honestly upon our earliest memories of childhood, must admit that we used to live imaginatively. You look at a schoolyard of children at play, and though we see them physically on the field, they are in imagination. Their experience is not limited by the senses, not one bit. If we can free ourselves from the seeming reality of the physical plane, we will find within our own consciousness the most marvelous being, and that being is ourself. We are told in Ephesians, Be ye imitators of God as dear children. I tell you tonight that it is no coincidence that children are the most imaginative and creative amongst us, for Blake told us that the eternal body of man is the imagination, and that is God himself. Quite a bold claim, but it will prove itself in the testing of it, if you will try it. Now how can we try it? How can we be imitators of God? Well, take something you want in this world. Perhaps a promotion so you have greater status, greater income. Perhaps a loving relationship, or some other noble aim. How would you go about creating it? The world will tell you, to be promoted you must be the hardest working. Show up early, leave late, and all that nonsense. For the loving relationship, we are told you must make your Tinder or Hinge profile in just such a way. Take the right pictures, go to these places, and all of these things. I tell you that if you are to be an imitator of God, you can put these facts and instructions of the world to the wayside. If we really want something, we must learn to create as God creates. And how is that? We are told in Romans that he calls that which is unseen as though it were seen, and the unseen becomes seen. It may sound strange, but this is a clue to use the imagination. At the present moment, bound as you may be to the world of the senses, perhaps you haven't gotten the promotion and the pay you desire. Well, using your imagination, could you conjure a scene implying that you have it? A simple scene, and you act it out in first-person present tense, feeling as you would were it actually true, here and now. Catch the mood, as Neville Goddard would say. You can do it. Feel the handshake and hear the congratulations from your co-workers. Respond as though you actually heard, saying thank you. Well, is that not calling the unseen as though it were seen? If you can lose yourself in the imaginal act, just as the children on the playground lose themselves to their imaginings, may I tell you that you will have it. That is the secret of manifestation. Maybe you feel you cannot see things in your mind's eye. If visualization does not come naturally to you, then you can simply feel the handshake and hear the voices, or just one or the other. The key is to feel as you would feel were your wish fulfilled now. Goddard said, The power of every imaginal act is in its implication. What does the feeling of the handshake imply? Or what does the congratulations imply? You feel it, and as you contemplate it, you are giving it the right of birth, and it shall come to pass in the world in its own wonderful way. Now some may call what I have just described as blasphemy, witchcraft. Some may say desires will keep you from enlightenment and tell you to go to India to meditate in a cave for all eternity, but you do not need to do that. Enlightenment is assured, but this modern world has modern problems for which God has blessed us with a law, and this law is the solution of all problems if you know how to consciously operate it. I say consciously operate it because we are always manifesting. Not a single experience in our lives happens independent of an imaginal act preceding it. It is man's faulty memory that keeps him in a state of victimhood. One goes on believing that they are the victim of a completely random, cruel, and indifferent universe. When, if they only learn to be aware of what they are imagining all day long, they would see when and where they planted the very seed that blossomed into the experience. We are told, as ye sow, so shall ye reap. You are mentally sowing morning, noon, and night by your imaginings. Do you have an issue with a certain person in this world? a colleague or a neighbor. It could be anyone. Pay attention to your thoughts and you'll find that you let yourself mentally argue with that one. I have done this. It is the strangest thing as though we actually take pleasure in these mental arguments. Little do we know we are sowing, and next time we see them we shall reap a physical experience giving effect equal to the feeling that we had when imagining. How can this be? God told us in the Bible that His name is I Am. That is his name for ever and ever, and by him all things were made, and without him was not anything made that was made. 
So you reap a poor harvest, and you want to cry out and say, Who is responsible for this? I am. He made it, and He is in you, as you. This incredible power of God given you because you are He. You can't get around it. I ask you, who is God? And you must say, I am. That is His name. Maybe you think I am misinterpreting. Let me give you this. In Matthew we are told, all things are possible to God. In Mark we are told, all things are possible to one who believes. Let's do the math. Mark is equating one who believes with God. You can't get around it. Maybe you think Jesus is the one and only Son of God, and we are simply lowly ants sent here for an unknown purpose. Jesus himself would disagree. He says in Psalms, I say ye are gods, sons of the Most High. How much clearer can it get? You are the God of your experience, and choose your experience by what you imagine, by what you think feelingly, by what you believe, by what you think habitually. When you accept this great responsibility, you accept this great power. This is not blaspheming. This is true prayer. We are told in Mark, When ye pray, pray as though ye have received, and ye shall have them. Well, isn't that what I've just described? You don't get on your knees and beg to an outside God to give you what you need. You experience your desire fulfilled as a present fact in imagination, and it will come to you. That is what Mark is telling us, but it is hidden that the truth may enter in at lowly doors. Why would God want us to beg when He knows our need? We are not told to beg in prayer, only to believe. And yet, there are the evangelists on television begging with a grand audience to an outside God, thinking that they are doing the right thing, a holy thing, and then for good measure they beg the audience for donations. Do not forget, it is his good pleasure to give us the kingdom. That is in Luke. You don't beg for it. You don't earn it by denying yourself food, drink, smoke, sex, or any other thing. If you don't enjoy these things, don't do them. But do not give them up believing it will earn you the kingdom, or enlightenment, or kundalini awakening. These days, many are celibate when if they were only patient, time will make them that way around their sixties. What's the rush? The kingdom is a gift given from God to Himself, for He exists in you, as you. Not a thing in this world came to be without first being imagined. The phone or device before you, the internet itself, the chair, the house, the clothes, all things were made by imagination, and that is God Himself. Now some have said, what of the trees and the animal world? These are divine imaginings, products of the subconscious. For without these things, this grand experience called life on earth could not take place. Your consciousness imagines an end, and infinite intelligence wills the means. The same is true for diseases. While no one may have specifically imagined the many illnesses of the world, there are those who all day long are in fear of losing their health. And because they believe it can be lost, it is done unto them by the infinite intelligence. I tell you, this is true if you test it. I ask you to test it, as we are told in James, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. Prove to yourself that imagining creates reality. Now let me tell you some personal stories about the law, so you know that this is no evil act. It is done in love. If you follow my social media, you may know of a trip I manifested with friends to Hawaii. It was a wonderful trip, but it was there that a friend of mine I've had since middle school informed me that his mother had cancer. I have known her as long as I've known him, and I was surprised at the news. Now, I am a firm believer that all things are possible to one who believes, so that same night I conjured a scene implying his mother was cancer-free. It was simple. I laid myself to sleep in our Airbnb and focused my mind by counting backwards from 100 to 0 with roughly 2 seconds between each count. Anytime my mind wandered, I returned to counting down. This technique I modified from the book the Silva Mind Control Method by Jose Silva. Upon reaching zero, I was in a slightly sleepy but focused meditative state of mind. The scene was short. I heard him tell me happily that his mother was cancer-free and we embraced in a hug. I repeated this short scene over and over, adding more and more sensory vividness and emotionalizing it to the point of tears. My physical body on the bed actually responded to the imagined scene with tears, and I knew it was done. Then I dropped the scene and carried that wonderful feeling of joy and gratitude into sleep. That was in May of 2022, and in February this year, 2023, I received a text from the friend inviting me to a Valentine's party at his house, and in the message he said in big capital letters, my mom is cancer free. Isn't it wonderful? 
It took nine months, but it unfolded in its own wonderful way. On my end, whenever I thought of her, I just calmly accepted within myself that she was already healed and it did come to pass. Is this blasphemy? Is this the work of the devil? I hope you do not believe so because you too have this power. We all do. I tell you, this is not to brag, but to inspire. I have not said a word of this to him because this is not some egotistical thing. I'm not doing it to say I, this little human named Brendan, am something great, bow before me. No, it is pure love. So I simply said congratulations on the wonderful news, and now I have the lovely story to share with you all. Here's another. My sister had just quit her job because she was being absolutely taken advantage of and overworked into oblivion. I dare say she was gaslit into terrible responsibility without the pay or the necessary support to match. Seeing she was eager for work, I asked her what her ideal job would be. She told me she wanted a remote job working for the state, making use of her associate's degree in business with more pay than she's ever made, great benefits, opportunities for advancement, work she enjoyed and was good at, to be appreciated and praised by her co-workers. All wonderful things. Her and I have a house together, and so knowing what she wanted, I set about to manifest it using this wonderful law. For if God is my own imagination, and all things are made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made, there is none other to whom I can turn to make it reality. I again on my bed before sleep entered a focused state akin to sleep, in the same manner as the other story. Then I began to conjure a scene, implying it was done. I imagine myself, first person, present tense, walking past her room. Her door is open and she is on her computer at her desk working. She's joyfully working. She's not stressed or worried. I ask her, how's the new job? Does it have everything you were looking for? She tells me, yes, it has great pay, benefits, and she goes on listing all that I heard her say she wanted. I say, that's wonderful. I repeated this scene three times, each time adding more sensory vividness and feeling the pure joy I would feel knowing her dream was a reality. A few weeks later, she was interviewing for a state position. She prepared well and told me the first interview went great. They told her they would let her know about a second interview within two weeks. Two days later, they asked her to do a second interview the following Monday. Again, it goes wonderfully. They tell her they will inform her of the verdict within two weeks. But that Friday, she gets a call offering her the job and letting her know she was the preferred candidate above the rest. They were so excited to offer her the job, they didn't even want her to wait the weekend. This job meant all the requirements she had told me, and that I had imagined. The story up to that point is told in my book, Doing God's Work, but more has happened since its publishing. About three months later, she decides she would like a raise. Who wouldn't? The facts of the world tell us it's too soon, it can't be done, but facts are malleable to God. We sit for just a few moments together and imagine that she's telling me the wonderful news that she has been promoted. Now at the nine month mark of having the job, she is being promoted with a significant raise and six months of back pay totaling $6,000. On top of that, thanks to a former boss who saw something in her, she is being paid on company time to attend classes worth thousands of dollars directly related to her field. These classes are paid for in full by her work, which will give her a project manager certification. Now within a few years, if she desires, she can become a contractor in that field. These contractors are said to make around $200,000 annually. Even her boss said to her, it is very rare that anyone working for under a year in that department gets a promotion as she did. I tell you, all things are possible, and when you act in love and in faith, you can work miracles for yourself or anyone else.